Because they cannot stand and sing, my God lives. Amen. My Lord walks with me and talks with me and leads me along my way. Thank God that we serve the Lord Jesus Christ and all that that entails. If you have your Bibles, would you open to the book of Matthew? And chapter 26, Matthew chapter 26, this morning we're going to begin reading at verse 69 and read the rest of the chapter through verse 75 for our text. And I pray that as I follow through in this message, there's, there, there, there's four, four steps in this message, four passages. Of scripture, all that include Peter. And I want you to, as we develop the message, I want you to, to put yourself in the shoes of Peter. And I pray that when all is said and done this morning, that each one of us here today will be able to relate to Peter more than we ever have before. I did part of this message this past Tuesday at the Calhoun First Methodist Church. I was actually coming to preach and, and, and I was given this scripture and, and I thought, Lord, don't do me any favors here. And, and I read the scripture and immediately the Holy Spirit spoke to my spirit and gave me the message for today. I only got to do a little part of it Tuesday because of the short period of time that I, that I had. But in this message, I, I, I feel like God has given me the answer to the question, why, Peter, did you deny Christ three times? I don't believe the answer is the obvious, which we all assume when we read this scripture. I believe it's sitting there in my study of my computer. Look, reading this scripture, God gave me the answer to why did Peter do this awful thing. Just stand with me and I'm reading God's holy word. Beginning at verse 69. Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also was with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what you say. And when he was gone out unto the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know that man. And then after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then began, began Peter to curse and to swear, said, I know not the man. And immediately the cock grew. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus said unto him, before the cock crows, thou shalt deny me thrice, and went out and wept bitterly. Today's title of the message, and then the rooster crowed. Father, we thank you for your blessings upon us. We thank you for this congregation, Lord, and we realize that we never ever will be assembled exactly this way again. Father, I thank you for the wonderful singing, both by the choir. And then by the specials, Father, and, 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 and thank you for the subject of the two specials, Father, as well as for the choir song, Lord, that, that we get, that they're so appropriate for this message you've laid upon my heart. And I pray for the next few moments the Holy Spirit will use your servant, body, soul, mind, and spirit, and bring the message that you've given to me for all of your people to understand. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. One could very honestly ask the question, why would a preacher get up on Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, before a congregation of believers 
and use this text for a message. I have never ever done that. I've never heard a preacher use this text for an Easter Sunday morning's uh, message. Because it seems like it's far fledged from what we're here celebrating today. In a short while, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion, signifying the blood and the body of Christ which was given to our sins. So why in the world would God give me this scripture as a text? And I think it's to get our attention because of the other three that gives with us. And, and we need to answer the question, why, Peter? Why would you do this? So as we think about this, I want you to think about, as I said, that we all can put ourselves in the place of Peter right here. In this instance. In this occasion of his life. From the account of this event, we find also in Mark, Luke, and John, we can get a little bit more completeness of the account. From the total reading, we find that both Peter and John followed Jesus into the city. Now, one of them, Judas, had already gone out and hang himself. That left 11. Of the 11, two followed Jesus into the city. The other nine disappeared. They left. Nobody knew where they were at. They did not want to be seen. They did not want to be heard. They were scared to death almost. But Peter and John followed Jesus into the city, and then John went all the way into the building, while Peter kind of stayed out on the porch of the building. And uh, with him. we can find also that uh, uh, John actually goes inside, as I said, uh, but uh, we find that other things that, that, that happened uh, as to why the things happened the way they did. And Peter when we think about this text and we think about Peter, he is probably known totally around the world more for this one event in his life than any other. Even those who don't, don't proclaim to be Christian, those who don't know a whole lot about the Bible, if you ask them about Peter, wherever you go, they'll say, oh yeah, he's the one that denied Christ. What about the nine that left him? But Peter is the one that's accused of being the great denier. Judas, of course, was the great traitor. And then Peter, the great denier. And, and it's, it's unfortunate that Peter has this stigma attached to him as being the great denier. Because Peter is one of those men of the Bible and one of those men of the New Testament that you and I would do ourselves proud to be like. Peter. And we don't think about that. And we need to, we need to, to give Peter his, his just due today. That in what he did here, he was given an example of all of us. And for all of us, as we're going to see. And in order to develop that, before, uh, I want to talk about three other events in the life of Peter and then put that with this one. And I want us to answer the question, why would Peter deny Christ? The first event I want us to look at is in Matthew chapter 14, verses 25 through 31. And, and you'll recognize it when I start talking about it. It seemed that Jesus was on one side of the Sea of Galilee with his disciples. And he was preaching and teaching. And, and one day he told the disciples... I want you to go over on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. I want you to get in a boat and go across the sea, and I'll meet you over on the other side, and I've got something I need to do over here first. So he put the disciples in a boat, and they set sail to go across the Sea of Galilee. The Bible says that Christ did what he liked doing more than anything else. He went up and met with his father and talked with his Father God, and was there in communion with God, and shared with Him. And while the disciples were, were, were on that boat, that ship going across the Sea of Galilee, all of a sudden there was a flash storm came up. Came out of nowhere. 
And the lightning began to, 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 to flash and the thunder began to roar and the wind began to blow and the waves got higher and higher and that boat, that ship was being tossed back and forth. Now it's a frightening thing to be called out on open water in a flash storm. I experienced that once down in the Gulf of Mexico. Out on a, on, on a private fishing boat, a man had invited me to go out on his private boat and we went out and was, it was, uh, it was uh, fishing. And all of a sudden, one of those, and I've lost it again. Yeah. Well, I don't know what's wrong with this thing. Turn one of these on, Gabby. All right, this is on. We'll go with this one. Because I want you to hear this. We was out there on that fishing boat, and all of a sudden, this great storm arose. And in our boat, boy, it was a frightful thing. We thought we were going drown for sure. And we couldn't control the boat. The wind was just carrying, the waves was carrying it. And all of a sudden, we found ourselves up near an island. And we gave that thing full throttle. And, and we prayed real hard. And we finally got to where that boat, we could anchor that boat over on that little island. And we waited out the storm on that island. But I got, a, I got just an idea of what these men were going through. They were scared for their lives. They were frightened. They all thought they were going to drown all that day. And all of a sudden, they, they look in, a, in, in, the, in the midst of the storm, and they see this figure in, in, in white, and they see it coming across the water. And, and they first said, uh, uh, what, what kind of spirit is that? There's a spirit coming across the water. And then they would have said, no, oh, that's an angel coming across the water. And then one of them said, wait a minute. That looks like Jesus coming across the water. And he's walking on the water. And as they got, he got closer and closer to the to the boat where the men were at, and Peter looks out at the ocean, and he's got his eyes on Jesus. I keep that in my thought in mind. He's got his eyes on Jesus, and he says, "Lord, if that be you, you bid me to come on the water to you." And Je Jesus simply said one word, "Come." And Peter, with his eyes fastened on Jesus, fastened on Jesus. He slides over the side of that boat and the first thing he realizes is he didn't see. He is standing on the water and he's got his eyes on Jesus and he walks toward Jesus and he keeps taking step after step but his body can feel the wind. His ears can hear, can hear the, the sound of waves make as they slap against the boat and against each other. And, and, and then all of a sudden, because of what he can hear and what he can feel, he began, he takes his eyes off of Jesus for a second to see the mighty waves around him. And when he does that, he begins to sing. And he hollers for Jesus, save me, Lord. And Jesus simply reaches out his hand and pulls him back up and walks him across the water to the boat. What happened to Peter? Peter took his eyes off Jesus. That's right. As long as Peter had his eyes fastened on Jesus, he could do what Jesus could do. Preacher, aren't you going a little overboard? No. Peter could do what Jesus could do. He could walk on water in the midst of the storm. But when he took his eyes off Jesus, then he began to sing. Well, the second passage is in Matthew chapter 26, verses 51 through 54. Did I Verses 51 through 54. This passage is just before the one I read. And here, Peter is with ten other disciples. And they're with Jesus. And Jesus had gone into the garden to pray. And uh, he finished his prayer. And as they was leaving the garden, they were met by a mob. And I say a mob because it consisted of so many different people. That was coming. It was not just the guard that was coming to arrest Jesus, but rather it was a mob of people. And they were facing thousands of people that had come. And they had come to arrest Jesus. And as they gathered there, the Bible says that one of the 
large, reached out and, and took the arm of Jesus. That's what we, we do things, don't we? We, we want to lead somebody. We want to take their elbow, take their arm, to lead them where we want to go. And this man took the, took the arm of Jesus, and when he did that, one of the one of the disciples stepped out. His name was Peter. And old Peter had a sword. He only had two swords amongst him, and Peter had one of them. And Peter pulled out that sword, and he whacked that man's ear off. Jesus looked at him and said, Peter, put away your sword. For they that live by the sword, they will perish by the sword. And Peter, uh, Jesus reached down and he picked up that hand here and he put it back on the side of his head and it was better than you. And of course they took Jesus, a Jesus prisoner. What was Peter doing? Peter had his eyes on Jesus. When that soldier grabbed his arm, Peter was looking at Jesus and he saw the soldier's arm. But his eyes were upon Jesus. And his eyes being upon Jesus gave him courage to draw his sword and stand up for Jesus and to fight for Jesus and to be in the right with Jesus. And he cut off that soldier's ear. Why? Because he had his eyes on Jesus. And then the other one is over in the book of Acts. We turn over to the book of Acts and we find chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, and then verse 41. An amazing thing happening with Peter once again. Up until this point, Christ has been crucified. He had been raised. He came back. The tomb was empty. Christ was walking with them and teaching them and talking with them, spending time with them. Christ had shown his ability to walk through doors, through walls. He showed them the ability to continue to do miracles. And he talked with them. And the last thing he told them was, I want you to go in into this room and wait on me. For I have got to go to my Father. But as I go to my Father, I'm going to leave a comforter to be with you. And he will abide with you forever on this earth. As long as you're here, he'll be here. So they had watched Jesus from that hillside. They watched Jesus. He's levitating. He just slowly raised up into the air, getting higher and higher and higher. And he got to the clouds, and he stepped up on a cloud. And there, there he was taken finally out of their sight. And then they went into this place called the upper room. And they waited there for the day of Pentecost when it was fully complete. And that day on, the, on, on Pentecost, they, uh, there was a sound like, like that wind out on the sea. Peter recognized it right off. It sounded like a roaring storm, a wind so fierce coming. And, 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 and it, 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 sounded like, it sounded like the wind, but it was cloven tongues. And, that, and that, 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 those cloven tongues lit up on each one of those people in the room, not just the disciples, but the others that were there also in the room. And it, it lit up on them, and they began to do something strange. First of all, they received the Holy Ghost. They received that comforter that Christ had promised them. And they began to speak in languages they did not understand. And they went down and downstairs and they began to, to speak among the people and, 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 and prophesy to the people in their own languages there. And, and, and these people said, so how can they do that? How can these men of Galilee, how can they speak our language? They don't know our language, but they're preaching to us. They're speaking to us about this man, Jesus. And they said, but somehow they must be drunk. Now, we, we seem to always want to want to associate something we don't understand with somebody being drunk, don't we? They said these men are drunk, but Peter stood stands up. And he says, Oh, you are mistaken. These men are not drunk and wine because it's early in the day. But rather they are filled with the presence of the Lord. And Peter began to preach to them this great message of Pentecost. And at the end of the message, he gave an invitation. And the Bible says that day, 3,000 souls accepted Christ as their Savior. 3,000 souls were saved. Now, I've never had that many people saved when I preach. 
That must have been one powerful message. 3,000 people were saved. What happened to Peter? Peter sensed Jesus. He couldn't see Jesus with his physical eyes, but because the Holy Spirit was now living within him, he could see Jesus with his spiritual eyes. And seeing Jesus with his spiritual eyes, once again he had no fear. Now he has the faith he had up on the water. Now he has, uh, he has the, 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 the courage he had when he took out that sword. Now he has the Spirit of God to help him say what he's got to say. And he stands with the authority of God preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit convicts people. And 3,000 people are saved. Why? Because he had his eyes upon Jesus. Amen. Then that brings us full circle back to our text. What happened here? What happened? Jesus was led inside the building where he was going to be given this mock trial and found guilty and sentenced to death. And Peter was outside. And people began to question him. Oh, wait a minute, you're one of his. No, I don't know what you're talking about. And a little while, oh, I, we recognize you. You were with, it, with that Jesus of Nazareth yourself. And oh, no, no, I swear, I don't know what you're talking about. And then others came up and said, oh, we do recognize you. Your speech gives you away. You was with this man, Jesus. And then Peter does the unthinkable. He begins to curse with his swearing. I tell you, I don't know this man. The great denier. What happened to Peter? In three scriptures we just read, Peter stood out as the great apostle of God. Peter stands out as the man you want to lead you into the greatest battle that you're ever going to find. Peter shows us the faith of a man that can walk on water. Peter shows us a disciple, a believer, a Christian who will not deny Christ no matter if it means death to him. And then all of a sudden, three Times in a row, he denied Jesus. And then the rooster crowed. What happened? In the first event, Peter saw Jesus beckoning him with open arms. In the second event, Peter saw Jesus needing him, needing his servants. In the third event, Peter sends Jesus of the Great Commission with him in the person of the Holy Spirit, leading him to share the gospel. But in this fourth event, our text today, Peter could not see, feel, or sense the presence of Jesus. Peter felt like Christ was surely going to die. For some reason, Christ allowed himself to be taken. And as far as Peter knew, Jesus could have already have been beheaded inside that building. Peter, Peter thought Jesus could already be dead. And because Peter was someplace that Jesus wasn't, he couldn't sense Jesus. Pentecost hadn't happened yet. He didn't have the Holy Spirit indwelling him. He couldn't sense his presence. He couldn't feel his love. He couldn't have faith in his power because he couldn't see him. He couldn't feel him. He couldn't sense him. He couldn't hear him. And Peter did not deny Jesus for the obvious because he was scared. This is the same Peter that pulled out a sword and whacked off a guard's ear. That's not the, a, a scared man. Peter was never scared. No. Peter just couldn't see Jesus. Peter took his eyes off Jesus. And I'm afraid that that's what so many Christians have done today. They've got themselves in a situation 
to where they can't sense Jesus. They can't see Jesus. And because they can't feel him, they can't sense him, they can't hear him, they can't see him, they put themselves in the position of denying him. Well, how do they do that, preacher? Well, they do it when they go to work. And they laugh at those vulgar jokes. And they laugh at people using God's name in vain and cursing God. When they remain silent when people talk about Jesus like he's a dirty dog. And they remain silent. They're denying Jesus. When they're in the supermarket shopping and they're called upon to be like Jesus and they don't. They're denying Jesus. When they ought to have an opportunity to speak up for Christ and to give the example of Christ and the Word of God to individuals in their life and they don't do it, they're denying Jesus. Why? Because they can't sense Jesus. Oh, but they have the Holy Spirit within them. There's a thing in the Bible called quenching the spirit. Yeah. Where we deny his presence. We deny his leadership. And we don't listen to him. That's why when you're sitting on the pew or you're out in a ball game or someplace and, and you feel this voice inside you saying, go over there to that man and that woman and witness to them. Go over there and tell them about Jesus. And you say, oh, I ain't going to do that. That's called quenching the spirit. That's denying the presence of God. Denying the voice of Christ in our, in our lives. And all around the world today, Christians are denying Jesus just like Peter did. We have the same potential as Peter. People don't like me saying that because somehow we want to put these 12 apostles upon this big pedestal that only they and Jesus can do that. But that's not what Jesus said. That's not how they acted. Jesus said, my authority I give to all my people. The Bible does not warrant individuals being, being singled out as being the only ones who can speak the power of God into people's lives. But rather all believers are supposed to be able to do that. Why can't you? Because they don't have their eyes on Jesus. They're not seeing Jesus in their lives. We are about to partake of the Lord's Supper. When I came out of the sermon this morning, Pam was here. Somebody go ring the bell. Pam wants to bring the kids up. When I came out, Pam was here with those teens. And she'd been talking to them about the significance of the Lord's Supper. And she said, I told them that they should not partake of the Lord's Supper with sin in their lives. You tell them why. <laughs> I said, okay. So I talked with them for a few minutes and I hope I did all right explaining, explaining that. But basically I told them that these instruments, the, the, the juice and the, and the bread and the cracker, yeah, they're just juice and crackers, but what they're doing symbolizing here is holy. The juice in itself is not holy. The bread in itself is not holy. But the juice symbolizes the blood of Jesus Christ. And the bread symbolizes his broken body for us. So that makes them holy because of their symbolism. It's the same way with the cross. The cross is nothing but two pieces of wood down together. Until it symbolizes the cross of Christ, then it becomes a holy thing. It becomes like that place when the, when the temple, when the synagogue, uh, wilderness and the synagogue was built in, in those wilderness, and then the temple was built, and they had this, first of all, they had the place that was the outside for everybody, then they had the, the holy place, and then they had the holy of holies. 
And in that holy place, they had the bread, they had the wine, they had the candles, they had these things. And all those things were considered holy and they had to be touched with, with holy hands and gloves and they had to be treated in a, in a special way because they were, they were holy. And that's what these instruments are this morning. This bread and this, this juice are, are holy because they symbolize the blood and body of Jesus Christ. And I think Pam did a wonderful thing telling these youth this morning, don't do it with sin in your life. And then as I left, I heard Pam say, I'm going to kneel in this altar and I'm going to ask forgiveness of any sin in my life before I'm going to partake of that Lord's Supper. And those that want to join me, join me. And when I came out from getting a drink of water, they were all in the altar praying. And I want to tell you this morning, that if you're here as an adult or a youth or a child and you've come this morning with unconfessed sin in your life and preacher you mean we can come to church with unconfessed sin we do it all the time the Bible says we sin daily and come short of the glory of God and we, we need to constantly be sinning and before we partake of this, this, this Lord's Supper this Holy Communion I want to take just a moment. I want, I want the four men that I've asked to come and assist to come on up. If you will, this time. The four men are going to come and help us. They're going to make me back in the nursery. Yeah. Go get her the Earl's going to help. I think one of them's going to help. And I want to take just a moment while Earl's coming. I want us to be in a spirit of meditation, the spirit of prayer, and I'd like every head bowed and every eye closed. And I want you to think about your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And anything that you have done, you shouldn't have done, and then I talk to the youth about the sin of omission. That's just as bad as the sin of commission. And omission means that we didn't do what God had asked us to do. We haven't done what the Bible commanded us to do. We haven't been the witness we ought to do. That's the sin of omission. And, and, and I want you, every one of us to think just for a moment before we partake of these sacred instruments of what we need to confess to Christ. And I want us to do that right now. Just take a moment. You and God. And if you have something to stand between you and God, if your eyes have been taken off Jesus for whatever the reason, get them fastened fashion back on Jesus by simply confessing those sins. And the Lord said He would be just and sure to forgive you. I'm going to be silent just for a moment while we do that. same time, two of the men will pass the bread down this side, the other two will pass the juice down this side, and then they beat the back, they will switch and come back down and do it the other so everybody can be served at the same time. If you will, just hold the bread and hold the juice until everybody is served, and then we will, we will participate.
Some don't, but I do. I believe the children have gotten old enough to understand their protective innocent lessons with pride. And I think it's good for them to understand what we're doing. Y'all just hold the children that we get ready to let you know what, what, what this symbolizes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like Would you stand with me, please, as we can take the In the New Testament, we find the, the early church and the apostles celebrating this Lord's Supper and communion. And they said that to the church, they said, what Christ delivered unto us, we deliver unto you. And pastors have been doing that ever since. Delivering what Christ delivered to the apostles, we deliver to you. And he said, in this manner, he took the bread and he blessed it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. I'm going to ask Brother Sanford, would you ask the blessing on the food, on the bread? Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. And we pray, Lord, that we can all realize that you take this to represent your broken body for the care of our transgressions. We pray that we ask in Christ's name. You may take. And the Bible says that in like manner he took the, the cup and he says this is the cup of my blood which was filled for the redemption of sin. Brother Roger, would you ask the blessing on the cup? Dear Lord, in heaven we ask you to bless this drink and bring people that take upon the uh, symbol of your blood. We ask you to bless it and go with us and guide us and be with us. We ask this in your name. Amen. 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 Amen.
the Bible said, and supper having been finished, that they sang a song and they went out, and they went out to serve. And we, I want us to replace the song with the blessing that God has given pastors to give to the people of God. And after we have the blessing, I want us to go out. And I want us to go out to serve. I'm hearing more and more as every week you read in the book, I put a little thing in there. But I'm hearing more and more of the excitement that some are having for Mount Zion Baptist Church. And, and what God wants to do through this church. And I believe with all my heart in, in what's being said. That God desires to do a great work through the congregation called Mount Zion Baptist Church of Recycling. And I want you to go out and, and pray about yourself. And then pray about each other. That we, that we all would be the, the great witness to Christ that he called us to be. That we, we don't apologize for what we believe. We don't apologize for where we meet. Don't, don't accept any of that stuff. Say, I don't apologize. It's all for the Lord. And then invite people to come and, and hear the great singing. And hear, the, hear the, the Word of God. It may not be the best preaching, but it is the Word of God. And, and, and come and hear that and, and lead people to Christ. And, Fill this church that we might have more people to go out and witness. And that we can win as many as we can before that day comes. Because the Bible is sure that one day God's going to say enough. And the end will come. Lift your hand for the blessing this morning. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. In Christ's name, God bless you.